So guys, this session is basically on black matters. So if I take a step back, so I I prepared this presentation I think a couple of months back for the internal presentation in my organization. So like to to the different psycho teams. And the whole intention of this presentation was to give the entire overview of glass mapper so that guys can connect end to end what glass mapper is used for and also with a special focus of new features being introduced in version also i got chance to present this uh, last month for uh, for the meetup happened in Auckland for site core user group and now doing it for a cg bangalore so in next 40 to 45 minutes, let us together focus on glass mappers and let's dive in. So a quick introduction about myself. I am Kumar Saurabh. So currently part of Psychore implementation team at AKQA Auckland. I have been playing with Psychore for the last four years while working with large scale digital transformation projects. Prior to that, I come from .NET background. So these are a couple of ways by which if you want, you can connect me. Regarding audience, so what I assume that everyone in this call are Sitecore enthusiasts and have been working with Sitecore. And also, I would assume that most of you would have been already working with glass mappers. So consider this session next 40, 45 minutes as a sort of refresher for glass mapper or whatever, means whatever you have been using. Okay, so next, let's set the agenda. I would try setting the expectation for this session. So in this, Entire presentation, I have tried dividing it into four sections so that I can uh, try to cover end to end entire glass mappers. So, if you see in section one, I will be talking about what, why, where, how do we install packages of glass mappers. And section one obviously is prerequisite for section two. So, once our packages are all done in section two, We'll be talking about different configuration which are available in Glass Mapper. So once all our models are configured, so in section three, we'll see about the actual calls which we are making via Glass Mapper to Sitecore so that in back in our application, our models are populated. So actually in step one, two, and three, the entire role of Glass Mapper would be done in terms of populating our model. Then in section four, we will be seeing that how we can make that model editable so that it suffices the need of experience editor features. Right? And throughout the presentation, I'll be using a lot of, you know, code snippets. And also it, towards the end, I'll be opening uh, the demo application and probably showing you all, like means whatever I'll be talking in different sections. I'll be showing you in the code. So that's all I have planned for this presentation. In terms of audience takeaways, like what can audience expect basically from this session is having an understanding of glass mappers and also to know about the important or say must know changes in glass mapper files. So this would be the takeaway. Right? Any question, guys, before I move on? Does this agenda make sense? Okay. So, moving on to section one. So, here we are going to speak about exactly what Mapper is. So, Glass project was basically founded by Mike back 2011, and it has come a long way like in terms of in which state currently it is. Like any other ORM, Glass also helps us in mapping two sets of objects lying in two different systems. So if we see what Glass Mapper does for us is that it helps us to map the data which is available inside Core 
to our object, which is available in our application. So basically, Glass is nothing but an ORM for the site code platform. And end of the day, what it does for us, after our models are mapped, it enables us for all sort of CRUD operation, along with the experience editor feature. So this is, in general, what Glass does for us. Now, why do we need Glass Mapper? Since most of you would be using Glass Mapper, so the obvious reason what comes in our mind is that if we use Glass Mapper, our code base is clean, right? No ugly stuff or no uh, doing all those boiler for calling the site code APIs. And it, it just not maps the data. It also helps us to map the complex relationship with just few of attributes, right? So like mapping parent, mapping children, mapping item. So all those relationship mapping is also very easy. And the most important thing why I advocate for glasses based on my prior experience is while writing site code unit tests. I can't imagine writing site code unit tests in the, in the feature project where glass is not used. I have instances uh, to name few, like wherein the functionality development took, say for example, one and a half day, and writing unit test was almost a week when it was using those site core APIs. So why, and so if I say this, like the like glass mapper makes it easy. So I also have valid points for that, because if we are using glass mapper, so all the interaction to site core is only via the interface service, right? So if we are having interface service, it is quite easy to mock it, right? By, by various mocking tools, whatever you want to use. And then we have models, we can fake it, and then use whatever unit testing framework we want, we can, we can go ahead and do unit testing. So yes, using Glass Mapper, site core unit test is quite easy. So end of day, what Glass Mapper does, it makes our development phase, I would say, comparatively easier. And then, and end of day, to any of us developer, it makes our life easy. So that was all about why would we want Glass Mapper. In this screen, uh, if we see, so we see here that Glass Mapper basically serves as an intermediate layer between our application code and the site code APIs. So if we don't want to use Glass Mapper, still it's not a must thing. We can still go ahead and call our APIs and do our work. But it's just an intermediate layer which actually eases our task wherever we want to interact with site code. Moving ahead. Now, where do we get Glass from? So obviously NuGet Package Manager is our help thing here. But in version 5, there has been big changes in terms of Glass packages. So if you guys remember version 4, right? So in version 4, whenever we used to install Glass package, it was a must-have that the project should be already having reference to site code kernel and site code MVC. Why was that? It was because the Glass package was having some sort of PowerShell script based on which it was actually checking that okay, if you are installing Glass for a particular project, so which version of Sitecore MVC it has. So based on those Sitecore references, it was able to detect what Sitecore you are running on, and then it, it used to install Glass assemblies accordingly. So for Glass package installation, there was sort of hard dependency between Sitecore references. This is something, so like this was one sort of dependency which Mike has resolved in version 5. And now, and now how he has resolved this, that he has released separate packages for different site code version. So this has been supported from site code 8 and above. So basically we have separate packages for each of the major site code releases. So this is one change which I see in site code uh, in Glass version 5. Moving ahead, even the NuGet package structure 
if I say structure, what do I exactly mean? So say in my project, I want to install Glass for version 90, which is for version 9.0. So I see four Glass packages available. <clears throat> And each of the and each of this package has certain references, certain start files. So in this will be uh, so in next slide we'll be seeing like what exactly these packages are, and when would we want to install each of this package. So if you see the first one, this is the main package. Then we have the core package, and then we have a separate one each for MVC and web form. Okay, so the main package, this package should be installed only once in your solution. So which, so if I say only once for your solution, so it means that once per site code instance. So if we are working for a non-helix solution structure, so probably it goes in website project. So what this package gives us, this package gives us all the references along with the startup files. And these startup files obviously should be uh, present once per solution. And if we are going for the Helix setup, so it can be obviously as we used to do previously as well. So it goes as part of foundation. Next package to consider is core. So this core contains just two important details for us. And again, point to this, that this package has to be installed in all the feature projects, or rather all the projects, wherever Glass has to be used. Wherever any code related to Glass Mapper has to be written, this package needs to be installed. Then you have two separate packages for MVC and web form, which can be installed depending if your feature is MVC dependent, go for MVC along with if your project is web form dependent, go for web form along with core. Right? So let's take a an example. Again, I'll be I'll be just saying a few statements based on what what mistakes and I have been doing before and what I have been seeing earlier. Also I have noted that that whatever project we have blindly just include all the references of class. So just imagine a class library, where, uh, which is say, where we are having some sort of business logic, which is agnostic of MVC or web form, right? So in that, we should install only this course. There's no point in installing MVC, web form, or anything else, right? So same thing goes for our unit testing project. So if our unit testing project is going to test only an MVC. You should be having core plus MVC. If it is going to test web form features, so we're going to install core plus web form. So with this, I am done with my section one. And by now, we have already understood how to install various packages of Glass in version five. And now we are ready to play with configuration. So in terms of configuration, if we see, so basically in Glass, our end goal is to map our model, right? Is to map our model with data available in site code. So if we are saying configuration, so we are saying configuring our model, right? So if we are saying, so there are, on, on the top view, there are three types of configuration, how we can configure model in Glass. So the first one is auto mapping, then we have attribute configuration, and we have fluent configuration. Let us discuss each one of them. Auto mapping, as the name suggests, it should be mapped automatically, right? So no special configuration required by us. What we need to ensure is that the naming conventions are right. So there are certain sort of naming conventions which we need to take care if we are going ahead with auto mapping. Again, not everything can be auto mapped. So if we are going ahead with auto mapping, what we can auto map is the item ID, 
we can auto map relationships we can auto map certain basic attributes of an item and we can auto map a field so if i say the basic attributes of the item so those basic attributes should be the uh, should be one amongst this enum value type and what convention we need to ensure is that our property name should be should be mapping exactly same as what we are seeing here so if we want to map id it has to be id if we want to map a relationship so property name should be same as parent children item and likewise so just taking an example of field auto mapping so if we have defined a certain fields in template and if we want to auto map this so we have to ensure that in our model class the property should be same as the field name okay so this was the basic convention how auto mapping worked but if you if you think so how does glass handles this internally this there cannot be any magic right so it has to be some logic or some algorithm based on which glass mapper handles it so let's integrate and just check what mike has written so we see that if we are going ahead with auto mapping so basically glass loops all the properties which we have in our model and have certain sort of rules based on which each of our property is passed so if we see here quickly uh, so first it going to check each property whether exactly its id if not it going to check whether each of the property is one amongst these relationship if not it going to check amongst all those you know enumerated values and if nothing matches it assumes its field and then map it to the template field so auto mapping is good but if we see internally so i would not go for it after saying this that okay it going to do all this extra sort of work just making easy for me that okay i am not defining any configuration in the code but each time whenever my model is loaded it going to do this additional checks so the suggested way would be if we are doing a real production application to explicitly define the configuration so for explicitly defining the configuration we have two option we have attribute configuration is the first one so in attribute configuration what we do is it is via c sharp attributes so basically we decorate our model class this attributes can be set on the class level or interface level where we can associate it to a particular template where we can enable disable caching and so on on field level or on property level we can decorate with field site core id different relationship pass queries so if we see here the other benefit is that if we have gone with auto mapping then we have to ensure that our template field in site core should not have any space right because our properties cannot contain space but in this case of explicit mapping even though there are spaces or there is anything inside the inside cms in template field we can actually map it with the field id or we can go ahead and map it with the field name so all those restrictions so we are free from all those restrictions here again uh, if you remember the uh, the enumerator which i showed you so all those uh, so all those basic attributes can be mapped in attribute configuration as well so we can go ahead and map item name display name url template name ids so whatever is available in that info type and and um, can be also explicitly mapped for a property so this is what we do in attribute configuration one other good thing uh, what i see about attribute mapping is so if we are doing an application that is not just glass mapper attributes right so our same model class can also have 
some sort of MVC validation attributes. It can also have some sort of site code search attributes. So if we go ahead with attribute configuration, so all our configuration for a model lies in the single place. So this is one good thing I feel personally for attribute configuration and why it is a preferred choice for me. Going ahead. So fluent configuration, though it is different, it gives us certain flexibility, which we'll talk in the end. But in terms of what it does, or in terms of configuration mapping, so actually it does the same thing. But, but it is written in a different way, so obviously it's a different fluent coding style, if you see in detail. So still here, we're gonna, so we have our model class, and we want to map each of the properties, right? So for using fluent configuration, we have to use site code fluent configuration loader. So we need to instantiate that. And basically, each model, whatever we want to add, we need to add it to the instance of fluent configuration loader. So we see here that we have, uh, so since I want to configure event list item model, I just went ahead and add event list item. And then in these lines of code, basically just by the fluent coding style, I am configuring the property. So I am saying map my field page title and the field name is page title. So it can contain space or whatever, depending on what is available inside templates. So we can, so same as attribute configuration here as well, we can map based on field name, field ID, info type. So basically everything remains same, just different coding style. So what is different and why would Mike would have thought for this? Like, like why should we, so means why should he be doing this fluent configuration option in glass? <clears throat> there can be different thing. One thing would be that he wanted to make sure that okay models are clean, configurations are kept separate, right? Single responsibility principle. Other important thing which I think is, now say uh, that models are present in a different assembly which we don't have access to. Probably we cannot go ahead and add attributes in that. So in that case, fluent configuration would be, a, would be a helping hand to us. Because here, we can still write, we can use those models in a different assembly and configure it at our end. So this is one place where I feel that fluent configuration would make more and more sense. So that is all about fluent configuration. Now moving it. So we have defined now all the configuration in this section, right? So let us understand that when will our configuration load in the application lifecycle. So if we have installed Glass Mapper out of box, uh, Mike has enabled on-demand loading. We'll later see uh, inside the startup files. So by default, out-of-box on-demand loading is enabled, which essentially means that our models are configured and loaded the first time it is used in the application. But if we are going for, you know, like production site application, we would not want this, right? We would want all our models to be loaded in the application start so that certain validations can be done. So for all sort of those, we have, uh, so we can override those uh, this on demand loading by turning it off and actually using these two configuration loaders, depending on what configuration we have used. If we have used attribute configuration for our model mapping, we can go ahead and use attribute configuration loaders or we can use fluent configuration loader. Again, I want to point on this because in my previous projects, I have never, you know, like went ahead and thought of that. So it was always out of box stuff left so that it was always on demand loading. So this is also one thing which we can include in our glass mapper checklist to go and check whether we need to, you know, load all the models in the application startup. So, let me show you. So this is from the from the Glass startup file, which is Glass Mapper SC Custom.cs. So out of box, 
this line is not present there, which essentially means that on demand loading is enabled. So we can go ahead, disable it. And then if we have used attribute configuration, so it is just one, uh, so it is just matter of adding one line of code here. Uh, just, in, just instantiating site code attribute configuration loader and passing the assembly name. So by passing the assembly name, what we do, so what we do is, so it internally loads all the models present in the assembly. So if it is the attribute configuration, just one line of code done and just pass this instance in our I configuration loader. That's all. But if we are using the fluent configuration loader, so after instantiating this, we also need to ensure that we are adding each of our model. Now this part can be in a separate, you know, class. As this is uh, just from my sample application, so I have added it, everything inside the stcustom.cs. But in real application, you would have wanted to, to put all these things in a separate, you know, mapping file. So that's all. And so in the same application, we can use both attribute and fluent. And in that case, we can uh, pass both the loaders. And by doing this, what we are ensuring is that all our model configuration is performed during the application startup. This can be useful if we want to perform some sort of validations on the model during the application startup. Now, we would have noticed, right, that all the properties are virtual in, in, the, in our model. So this is sort of, yeah? Uh, one second, I guess uh, presentation is gone. Can you see? Is it going to the presenter? I am not seeing. Is anyone else seeing? Uh, I don't know. No, I guess no. Can you present it? One second. Are, are you the presenter? One second, let me check. It says we waiting for viewer 29 to let you share your screen. Okay. One second, I reclaim and I'll, I'll give you the presentation. Oh yeah, please. Sorry guys. Yeah, I passed you, presenter. Probably I was allowing someone and then I would have given the yeah, yeah. Yes, sure. yes. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, we can see your deck. Okay. So, uh, back to presentation, yeah. So, I was talking about the, you know, keyword virtual which we make sure we write everywhere, right? Whenever it's a glass mapper model or glass mapper class, we make sure that all our properties are virtual if we are using glass. If it is interface, it's by default virtual, but for class, we ensure that it should be always virtual. So, like means why do we do that? So if we think on that perspective, so virtual, if we think from the OOPS concept, virtual is something which can be overridden. So what glass internally does is, that if your model, uh, like it enables lazy loading by default. So what do we mean by lazy loading is that if, if your model contains any, any sort of relationship or basically whatever property is there, so it gets end of day loaded only if we access that. So for enabling that lazy loading, Glass basically needs to dynamically generate some sort of proxy class on the fly which will, act, which will actually wrap our model class. And to be able to inherit and override the properties which we have defined, they need to be marked as virtual. So to enable this lazy loading or deferred loading, this will work only if we mark our properties as virtual. Right? So this is the main reason why we mark our property as virtual inside the class. Going to caching, so we can also, uh, so if, uh, if you remember Glass version 4, so we were able to uh, map, or we were able to decorate caching on the property level or on the field level. But here that field level thing has gone in version 5, 
we cannot do at the field level. Uh, so it can be either done on the class level or we can go ahead and, uh, and, and enable disable caching while we are fetching data from site code via one of the interface service, which we'll see again later in the next section. So one thing regarding caching is we should, all, we should also think that when we should enable caching or not, because if we enable caching, then lazy loading gets disabled. Now, lazy loading is something which we have seen in the previous slide, right? If lazy loading gets disabled, which actually means that the entire object graph of the model is mapped in the beginning itself. So just imagine from the, perf from the performance perspective. So your entire heavy model is mapped in the beginning. So if, if at all we are going ahead with this caching, I would suggest cache some sort of settings item or configuration item, which is reusable across various rendering. And this cache gets cleared on publishing similar as site core HTML cache. So I think this is all regarding the section two, which was about the configuration. Going to section three, services. So till now what we have done, we have installed package, we have already done basic configuration to our model. Now, now step three is to fetch data. So for fetching data from site, from site core, all the fetch calls or all sort of CRUD operation happens via interface services. It was same in version four as well. It is same in version five as well. What is different is there are new addition, there are few deletions. Let us see that. So in version five, these are the available services. If I go from the bottom, I site code context is something which we have been using most right in version 4. But now it is deprecated and it is deprecated for good I would say. So instead of I site core context, we have three specific interface service, I web form, I MVC, I request, which we can use in different scenarios depending on, on our need. As the name suggests, we would be using web form if we have a web form used in our feature. Same goes for MVC. Request context would be used if it is, you know, agnostic of MVC web form. So all these three are new in version five, and this has gone. I site code service remains same, but there are a lot of updates in I site code service. So if I say in terms of updates, which we'll see in detail in the next few slides, so actually it has become more neat, I would say, less number of overloads and more sort of segregated. And in terms, so I site code service, it was singleton, it is still singleton. And all the three new uh, no, interfaces, so if, uh, if I speak in terms of their concrete implementation, so all these three new are still scoped and, and it has to be done per HTTP request. So nothing has changed in terms of that. Going, so as I said, like I site core service comes back from the earlier version. What has changed here is less number of overloads. So if I say less number of overloads, so how, how Mike has made it possible? He has made it possible by some sort of options class. So he has introduced options class in version five. No, was there any question? Was there any question? No, sorry, you okay. can continue, I think. Yeah. So, so how it has been possible in version five is via options class. So we will see the available options class probably in the demo as well and also in the next slide. In terms of methods, what we have, I think populate is something which has been introduced new in version five. A part of that, those are the same set of methods. And see here the available options class. So there are predefined options class if we are retrieving by path, if we are retrieving by ID or by query. And if we are going for collection of items retrieval. So we have something interesting 
been introduced as get items by func. As the name suggests, we can have our custom function because it allows us to create a function that represents a set of items to be mapped. So I imagine this scenario would be helpful if we have some sort of custom logic to pull data from site code, which is not sufficed by the available predefined options. Right. So if you're able to see my screen, I'm not sure how short the font is. But in the first half, I have put how, you know, I site code service was in version 4 and how it is in version 5 even without going in detail and and this is you know just half of the of the interface details so i've just taken the first half screenshot and if you see in version 5 how neat and how clean it is so what difference you see just for get item how many number of overloads we had and it is not that 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 all this feature has gone in version 5 we still can configure all sort of things which we use to do in version uh, four three by using options class. You see here, we just pass the options class, and and whatever configuration was as part of this method parameter can be done via the options class. So this is how it has become neater, more segregated, arranged in version five. Next we have I request context. So I request context. Obviously, it will be used in scenarios like, for example, if we have to use glass in computed field, pipeline, event, where it does not know whether it's MVC or web form, so we can go ahead and go for I request context. These are sort of methods which are available. I will not go in detail. Yeah, so I request context, again, this is a new one, as I have told earlier, and it, obviously it would, it would contain I site code service. Next, IMVC context. Obviously, we'll be using it for any feature where we have been, where we have implementation done via MVC. And it contains, and it gives us access to fetch data source, page context, so everything related to our MVC controller rendering or view rendering. So it contains everything. All right, so if we see in detail, Again, IMVC context is inherited from I request context. So we have access to all the methods available in both. I form context. Obviously, we'll be using this one if we have any feature development which is based on web form. So if we see uh, these three new interfaces or say interface service which has been introduced in version 5, so each one of these has specific purpose or specific usage, right? So now, let me move this, yeah. This is one important thing which I wanted to focus on. So if we, are, so if we have been using Glass from last couple of years, from last couple of years, so we will be having the habit of always using Glass controller, right? Like inheriting our controller from Glass controller, so that we get the access to get data source item, get rendering parameters inside Glass Controller. This is how even I generally used to do it earlier. But now in version 5, Mike has said a big goodbye to Glass Controller. So if you use Glass Controller in version 5, it says Glass Controller is obsolete. And this class will be removed in future. So actually in version 5, as of now, it's not removed but it's going to be removed soon. So it's high time that if we are upgrading from 4 to 5, just do a couple of lines rewrite so that this glass controller is not there. And instead, what do we do? So obviously, glass controller gave us access to context item, data source item, rendering parameters. Like these are the three things which we used to use often, right? So how do we going to do it? If we have seen the three new interfaces, right? Introduced IMVC context, I request context, web form context. That contains everything. So if it is, so if we are doing in version five, we can simply instantiate from our MVC context and just call 
the get context item, or, the, or it basically it contains everything whatever we had in glass controllers. So nothing to worry. It's more structured and more easy to use once we start using it. So this is all about the you know services. So by now we have understood how do we make call to site code via these interface services. And now we have got data back. Data is mapped to model. So now this model can be easily passed to front end. Data is shown to the end user, everything done. But since we are working with site core, we would also want to make this model as editable, right? So for doing that, we have Glass HTML. Again, this is something carrying forward from version 4. Nothing specific introduced. Till now, I have not discovered anything specific which has been introduced as part of Glass HTML in version 5. So I just wanted to focus on a few things regarding Glass HTML. So in version 5, if we are using Glass HTML, it is advised to go with the HTML helper methods available in iGlass HTML. So go with editable, render link, render image, begin edit frame depending on your field type, like whatever field type we have. One important thing to mention here is that whenever we are using these helper methods and passing our model to make it editable, let's ensure that it contains ID. Why it would need ID? Obviously, because if we are enabling the experience editor feature, so someone is editing the content and that needs to be edited back in CMS. So for that, Glass needs ID to be available in our model. So this is one thing which we should take care of. This is just for the iGlass HTML, all the available helper methods which we discussed in the previous slide. And one thing I would like to show is regarding render image. So if we are using render image, we can actually enable or disable, like suppose if we, uh, we have a, a parameter true-false by which we can enable, disable if we want that image to not be editable in experience editor, and same goes for render link. Same as glass controllers, we, even Mike has said a goodbye to glass view as well in version 5. So glass view, Actually, in version 4 itself, Glass View also existed and HTML helper also existed. But I think Glass View goes back to version 3 uh, and probably why it was introduced uh, would be because in back those days, it was like in world of MVC, we, we used to have custom based view types, right? But now since slowly it's changing from that custom view types, and now if we have n number of tools, we cannot have n number of custom views and go on, keep on inheriting it. So basically this glass view concept itself would be now out from version 5 itself. And instead, Mike is saying us to use HTML helpers, which is already available and does the same thing. So that is all about glass view getting obsolete in version 5 and how we can make our models editable in version 5 using HTML helpers. So, so Gopi, how much time do we have more? <laughs> we have around uh, 10, 15 minutes. Gopi? Can Hello? Gopi, how much time do we have more? I'll just try to... 10 minutes, right? Yeah. Sure. So, uh, so actually, uh, in the presentation, what we have seen is, you know, all those four sections which I have discussed earlier in my agenda. So in section one, we have seen about all the packages, what Glass Mapper is. In section two, we have seen all the configuration, like auto mapping, attribute configuration, fluent configuration. And, and how different all these three are amongst each other. And once our models were configured in section two, in section three, we have seen all the interface services, all the various changes in the interface services, newly introduced services, and how glass controller is obsolete. 
In section four, we have seen how we can make this model editable using the proposed HTML helpers and try not to use the glass view as it is getting obsolete in version five. So this was the whole sort of you know presentation. And in this demo, uh, if you see it's my okay. Just this will take some time, right? So let me go back to code till it gets loaded. Yeah. So uh, let us go. Uh, each section wise what we have discussed in the presentation. So in terms of package, I, uh, so it was just a basic solution, right? So it just contains two projects. One is my main website project. In terms of package installation, what I have done is I have installed the base package, which gave me everything for Glass in my base website project. And in my test project, since I am only using MVC, so I have installed core, uh, core package and I have installed MVC package. I have not installed webform package here as I don't have any unit tests related to webform features. And in terms of startup files, which so uh, after installing the, the base package, we get these startup files. So if you see, it clearly says that do not change anything in this file. Why? Because if you upgrade, so all your changes get overwritten. So for that, we have scustom.cs. So whatever customizations we have discussed you know, during our presentation, I would just like to quickly show that. So here is something by which we can disable the out-of-box on-demand mapping. And if we have disabled that, we would want to you know, use either of attribute configuration loader if we have used attribute configuration and just pass the assembly name, that's all. If we have used Fluent Configuration, we have to ensure that all our models are added to Fluent Configuration. Again, in the ideal case, you would want to move this code out of this fccustom.cs. And then all the instantiate, like whatever objects of this configuration loader can be just passed here. So by doing this, all our configuration, all our model configuration gets loaded in the application startup. Yeah, in this session, I'm not focusing on ad map. This will be probably sometime later. Okay, so now let's see about the auto mapping which we have discussed. So in auto mapping, it just case goes based on the condition. There is, so model is clean. There is no configuration defined, but the only thing we should be ready for that big if else logic which we have seen what Glass does internally if we go ahead with auto mapping, right? And so in terms of how easy it is, right? So once our model is done, so what we do, if you see in the controller, so this is our, uh, so I've been using here MVC controller. So it was just one line, like I have defined my model and it is just calling the context item, passing it and hooray, my data is mapped, right? So this is how data gets mapped, passed to the view. In the view, if I would like to show, so I have been using all the HTML helper methods. Like I want to make this image as editable, so I have passed it as true. Nothing special, same what we have seen, what we have discussed. If we see attribute configuration, so obviously we can decorate the model or our class. So we can decorate our class on the model level. We can decorate it on the field level based on item ID, field ID. Uh, so Saurabh, field ID. Saurabh, can you make the screen a little bit 125% maybe? Uh, code, the visual studio, yeah. Is it better? Yeah, yeah, it is better. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, and this is also an example of, you know, attribute configuration, wherein 
we see that how we are mapping the actual ID here. So if we are decorating it with site code ID, so it can be named as even ID one or whatever I want to map, uh, whatever I want to name this property because now the mapping would be done explicitly by the attribute. Right. So this is all sort of attribute configuration. Next, I'd like to show about fluent configuration. So in fluent configuration basically are and all this actual configuration can be either done in a separate class. So here I have done in the same class, but it can be actually done in a separate class. So here also we can do all those configuration based on field name, field ID, and and the basic attributes available in the enum and also basic attributes like context path, play name. It mainly I have been using always this URL property to map the item URLs. But even all like whatever we see in this enum type can be mapped to a property. So that was related to configuration. So all configurations done. In terms of services, <clears throat> let me go in one of the controller. So this is just some constructor injection. I'm not going in detail here. So basically what it says that once my model is decorated, I simply do a call via my interface service. So since it was my controller, which was MVC, I just used IMVC context and then I put a, and then I get whatever I want. I get the page context. I get, you know, data source item, page context, rendering item. So whatever is required for controller rendering, almost everything is there. We can also use the methods available in request context or site code service. So this is all about interface services. Okay, let us see about, you know, options class. So remember I was saying about the options class and how it has been introduced once we are using site code service. So this is not ideal way of doing things using item path, but yeah. So this is again a predefined options class get item by path option. So here we can define certain configuration. So if you see all the configurations available, so these are the stuffs which was the part of those methods. If you remember how how the service was looking in version four, it was having big method overloads, right? With tons of parameters. So all those tons of parameters now can be defined as part of the options class. And it can be passed once we are calling our method. Simple, right? Just call the item and pass the options class as a whole instead of passing 100 parameters here. This is one thing which has changed in terms of iSight core service. Um, nothing other great here. In terms of testing, I would like to just quickly show. So obviously if everything is interface service, right, so we can easily mock it. Here I've been using a simple uh, scenario using, using substitute, but we can use any of the mocking framework. We have our model, we can just put some dummy data. And by whatever testing framework we're using, we can just go ahead and write our unit test. That was all and, and considering time I would not want to just show you and like how you know content editing works in site code. This is something which you guys know. So yeah fine. Uh, so Gopi I think I'm done with whatever agenda I was having. Probably can go for Q&A. Uh, yes. <coughs> Anybody? Uh, have any question you can put in chat or you can unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Yeah. We'll see if anyone has any questions. So there can be no question only in a scenario either it, it was so boring <laughs> that no one was listening or that it was so clear. <laughs> uh, 
I, I believe most of the people are familiar with glass mapper which is already yeah. working on but I guess maybe the only version 5 changes which are a little bit tricky because uh, there are some things are absolute now which we need to yeah. take care while upgrading the solution yeah yes that's one uh, anyway no more questions if, if you have any questions feel free to reach us in WhatsApp Saurabh is also there in our WhatsApp group or outside you can directly reach Saurabh as well so uh, if any if okay. there are no other questions yeah thank you Saurabh it was it was yeah I would just like to uh, take a moment here uh, Gopi yeah. also yeah. to uh, you know like give credit to Mike for his you know yeah. whatever stuff he has put down in his training so guys I would encourage you if it's possible to go and uh, go and just subscribe for his training courses his training course has, is really good so and and actually it helped even me to understand all bits and pieces of glass mapper so yes if it's possible i'll encourage you guys to go and enroll for the glass training yeah that's all yeah. that's from me thank thank you everyone thank you sir no problem